Hello, wrestling fans. We're here with not one, but two superstars of wrestling here with Nikita Koloff, the Russian Nightmare, and Magnum TA, an old friend of High Spots, uh, back for a second round. Uh, a little different this time. Instead of a, a long uh, biography of everybody's career, we're gonna we're gonna talk about how these how these two performers and their careers cross paths. So, welcome to each of you. Thank you very much for being here. Hey, good to be with you. Yeah, my pleasure. The uh, we always start off every interview with just to give some background with uh, how each of you got started in the wrestling business. I'm going to ask Nikita first. If you just go ahead and share that with us. Well, I, I had a, a, a bit of a different uh, uh, introduction to, to pro wrestling than, than I, I suppose many of the guys in that uh, I didn't really necessarily grow up being a fan of professional wrestling. From a very early age, I had a, 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 um, a fascination about pro football. And so from about the sixth grade, roughly about the age of 12, you know, I, I started envisioning, having this vision that I'd play one day in the National Football League. And, and about that same time, I began to, to uh, uh, come across some muscle magazines, began to look at these muscle magazines and, and, and envisioned myself, you know, being one of these muscled up guys uh, who, who uh, would cross over and, and play in, in, the, in the football league. And, and so began to set my sights on that and, and growing up in, not in, uh, you know, not in Vladivostok or, you know, and, and certainly not uh, drinking any Stoliknaya. Uh, you know, the, the fans probably gather by now, especially with the, you know, my, my speaking of perfect English that I didn't actually hail from, you know, the Soviet Union. Uh, they probably gather by now, I must be from somewhere within the United States, which was, uh, would have been Minnesota. And so I, you uh, know, in Minnesota we had the old AWA with Vern Gagne, and, and I would occasionally come across and surfing through the channels. You know, I'd see the the All Star Wrestling sanctioned by the AWA and Vern Gagne, and, and I'd catch a glimpse of that every now and then. But again, wasn't necessarily a, a, attracted to it, or, or so to speak, or it wasn't uh, real appealing. In fact, people ask, well, you must have wrestled in, you know, in. in high school and I said no I hated wrestling just the thought of two sweaty guys locking up with one another and you know <laughs> grappling it just did not appeal to me I was like give me a helmet and some shoulder pads where I can rip somebody's head off and was much more appealing to me and so uh, you know I, I was not fascinated in any aspect of, of, of wrestling or professional wrestling and so pursued that whole football career through high school through college scouted by the National Football League and it, it would uh, be some injuries some actually some broken legs that would would be a setback for me that caused me to spend uh, uh, some extra amount of time in the gym uh, still with my sights set on playing in the National Football League even after I graduated college uh, you know dreaming of, of walking on as a free agent that some of my buddies uh, couple guys known as as the road warriors the legion of doom and and uh another guy by the name of ravishing rick rude and another guy by the name of barry darso who wrestled as crusher khrushchev as one of my partners uh, down the road ironically uh, and later went on to be one of the demolition up in the wwf uh, these guys had Hey, we're going to a training camp, and, and I, I, I heard about this, and I went a couple times and, and watched him, and I thought, these guys are just just absolutely characters, you know. It, it, it works for them, but, you know, I'm still going to play football and, and continue to train uh, f towards that goal. And they broke into the business and, and, and trained. An animal who was a very close personal friend uh, caught on with Georgia Championship Wrestling. And I came down and spent a couple months with him while he was, uh, while he was in the circuit with them. And, and I came down, again, just to continue my training for pro football and had actually lined up a, tri a tryout with the United States Football League uh, at that time, the USFL. And I'd hit the arenas every now, now and then with those guys and sit in the back and just kind of take it all in and just chuckle and think, well, you know, that's really great for them. And, and it would be... Uh, uh, just a few months later, actually, that, that was in that was in January, February of, of uh, 1984, and I went back to Minnesota, continued my training. That I got a call in April of '84 from Animal, and I'll never forget. It, it was nine o'clock one morning, and he said, well, "You know, what are you doing?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I'm just waking up. What are you doing?" And 
He said, what, what do you think about wrestling? And I said, I think you guys are doing great. You know, it's super, you know, watching you on the super station on TBS. You guys, are, I think it's wonderful what you, he says, no, no, no. What do you think about wrestling? I said, you mean, what do I think about wrestling as in being involved in wrestling? <laughs> and he says, yeah. I said, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, yeah, this guy, Don Canodal, had approached him and, and said him and, uh, uh, Ivan Koloff had been talking, and Don had, had, uh, actually Don and Sergeant Slaughter had come up with an idea, the whole concept, you know, of, of uh, you know, Nikita Koloff, you know, being, was actually born without me being there, because they came up with the whole idea of a nephew for Ivan, and, and just this whole story, and, and Don, as Don had shared it with me, on a drive from Charleston, South Carolina to Savannah, Georgia, him and Sarge bought a notebook one night, and and wrote this from start to finish the whole angle of Nikita Koloff. And so he approached the animal and said, do you know any big guys, you know, that, you know, basically are doing nothing <laughs> and, uh, and wouldn't mind shaving their head? And, and, and he said the animal looked at him and, and, and in a split, in a nanosecond, just went, I got just the guy. And, and, and so he called me that morning and said, and, and kind of laid out the idea and I said, man, do these guys know that, you know, that I've never been in a ring? You know, I've never hit a ring rope. Do they know that? <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've told, you know, I said, well, what, what would I need to do? We'll call this promoter. The guy's name's Jim Crockett and give him a call. And, and uh, I said, well, okay, give me the number. I thought, and in, in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, if they can do it, you know, if Animal and Hawk and these guys can wrestle, <laughs> Surely I have enough talent that I could do it as well. If and if nothing else, I'd give it a shot. What what I got to lose? And because if it doesn't work out, I still got my pro football tryout lined up. And so I I called the number, called Jim Crockett, and had about a five minute conversation with him. Introduced myself as you know, Roadway Animal told me to call you, and and, and told him up front on the phone. I said, now Mr. Crockett, I said I'm told that you you were told that I've never been in a ring. Have no ring, you know, no no wrestling experience whatsoever, and, and I, I remember at first, you know, and Terry, you know, with, with his dry personality, at first he was kind of like, what, oh, you know, what, no, oh, they didn't tell me that, you know, and, but then, you know, after a few minutes, he's like, well, well, you know, that's okay, you just, and we concluded the conversation with, well, be in my office on June fourth with your head shaved bald, and I said, okay, I'll I'll see you there, and so to kind kind of uh, you know conclude that part of the story you know I, I loaded up my car called animal back told him I had the conversation that Crockett told me what day to be there and and um, you know I lo a couple weeks prior to that I loaded up my car with everything I owned to my name and all $250 cash money that I had to my name and, and headed to a state I'd never been you know to Charlotte North Carolina and stopped in Atlanta along the way and Animal helped, helped me get some wrestling boots and, and a, a, a pair of tights. And, and on that day, I walked in on June 4th that day. I never, never forget it. I drove up 85 from Atlanta and didn't know where I was going. Drove right, right. I, started, I saw the city. Started thinking, I'm starting to pass the city. So I stopped, got a pay phone. You know, no cell phones in those days. So I got a pay phone, called the office and said, here's where I'm at. And they said, oh, you went too far. And I just vividly remember, you know, backtracked. I was at Sugar Creek, was the gas station where I made the call from. It's still there, the gas station. Backtracked down to Billy Graham Boulevard, came up Billy Graham, turned on South Boulevard, and and, and turned in and walked in the office, introduced myself, and they brought me back to Crockett's office. He took one look at me, and he said, uh, "Man, take your shirt off." So I took my shirt off, and you know, I, and I've been training. You got to keep in mind literally eight hours a day in a gym. I was in, in the gym for, for a, over a year and a half after I graduated college, training for this pro football tryout. So I had beefed up to 285 pounds, 8% body fat, 34 inch waist. So when I walked in, took my shirt off, that's what Crockett saw. You know, he's looking at, and, and he said, well, wait right here. And he walked down the hallway, never forget, I st I'm staying in the hallway by myself, you know. <laughs> hey, he walked down the hallway, came back in through a set of double doors with two guys, now, mind you, I, I didn't watch wrestling. So two guys, and he says, hey, you know, it's Ivan Koloff, Don Cronodal, meet your new partner. And, and we stood in that hallway, and they said, well, let's see, okay, what, what, what shall his name be? 
And, and she said, well, we've got Nikita and we've got, and I don't even me- remember the other choice, but when they said, when I, I remember standing in the hallway going, Nikita Koloff, Nikita Koloff, Nikita Koloff. I like the ring of that. Yeah, Nikita, sounds good. I'll, I'll, I'll take Nikita. I go, okay, Nikita it is. So, Nikita, you're Ivan's nephew, and, and, and they were cutting interviews. And said, I want you to walk on the set. Don't want you to say a word. You know, you're just off the boat, so you speak no English. I'm like, cool, all right, that works. And, and just stand behind him, you know, look mean. I haven't given you your chains. I'm like, that works. And, and uh, we did all these interviews for several hours, finished the interviews, and they said, tomorrow night you'll wrestle. Now, I've never been in a ring. And, and so we got a big four hour television taping in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it, it's kind of a who's who of wrestling. So. <laughs> Yeah, long story short, we get there late, no time to get in the ring. Crockett wasn't going to let me wrestle. Ivan went to him, convinced him to give me a shot. And the only thing I would say when he came back, he said, okay, here's the deal. He said, whatever you do, don't trip on the ropes getting in the ring. He said, because Crockett said, if he trips on the ropes, he's history. He's out here. Now, mind you, the place is packed. It's sold out. <laughs> And, you know, I later find out all these guys on the card, you know, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, King Kong, Bundy, the, the who's who of wrestling. Well, I'm going, okay, you're du- Dusty who? Oh, Rhodes, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. know, King, King who? King, oh, King Kong, Bundy. Oh, nice to meet you. Bam, bam, who? I didn't know any of these guys. I had no, no clue who these, but yet many of them had already become superstars in the business of wrestling. And here I'm just, you know, green neophyte. So anyway, so, so he talks, and I said, okay, I think, okay, shave my head, don't speak, look mean, don't trip on the ropes. I think I can handle all of that. And, and, and so we're in the dress room, and as Don Canola has many times told me the story, he said, and I, I came up to him and I went, Don, what do I do? I've never been in the ring. You know, I've got the, and I've, I'm having this televised TV match. What do I do? He says, come here. And he shows me a couple things, bend the guy over, you know, hit him on the back, shoot him in the rope, put him in a bear hug, and that, that'll be the deal. And uh, so we, we went to the ring and, oh, gosh. you know, the laws of association, right? You know, where, where it says, you know, you, you can become guilty with who you, just who you associate, right? And that can be a good thing. That can be a bad thing. Well, in this particular case, they didn't know me from Adam, but because Ivan and Don were the world tag team champions and, and, and had all this heat on them. And so it didn't matter just because I was associated with them. Man, people were booing me when I got in the ring. And, now, mind you, I'm looking around going... Yeah, this is a whole new world to me. I'm like, man, people are throwing stuff at me. And I'm like, okay, all right, well, this is kind of cool, I guess. I don't know. And, and 11 seconds later, you know, the bell's ringing. I had my first win in a professional wrestling match. And, and at the time, that was unheard of to, to have won a match in 11 seconds on television. It was unheard of. And, and uh, that was my introduction in, in, into pro wrestling. And, and, of course, as time went on, I... We get to the rings early. I train and then have a match, and and things just kind of kind of took off from there. And, and you know we can we'll, we'll cover some more of that uh, as as we see. So you say that you weren't even a fan of wrestling, but I know Magnum. I know I know that's complete opposite case. You were a, a tremendous fan of wrestling before. Yes, we 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 started you know east and west of each other literally because uh, my earliest memories of television were watching professional wrestling and and and. You know, my, you know, watching Batman and Robin and all that, that was one thing. But watching wrestling, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling on Saturday nights, that was a big deal. And as I grew up, and at 13 years old, the sport that I chose was wrestling. It had nothing to do with because of professional wrestling. It was just I went to a school where there was no football. I was in that prep school Mm -hmm. league in Virginia. So we had soccer, we had basketball, we had wrestling. And I chose wrestling and wasn't a natural athlete, was a skinny kid that everybody kind of uh, thought was geeky and, and uncoordinated and, and uh, just not really well suited at anything, but it was a very character building one-on-one type sport, different mm-hmm. than anything else that uh, was out there available to me at the time. And I grew up kind of in that school of hard knocks in that, in that genre of, of athleticism. Uh, being 132 pounds, starting out, building myself up to 167 pounds, which back then I thought that was huge when I was a sure. senior in high school, you know, and, right. I, and I was state champion in Virginia in 1977. And, and my, my idols were people like Dan Gable. I had these dreams of going to the Olympics mm. and, and, wow. you know, and just, you know, read books about these people, you know, lived, you know, breathed, slept, slept 
you know, this goal of, you know, one day being an Olympic champion and went on freshman year of college and at 167 pounds. And I had never done anything but diet year round. You'd been trying to build yourself up. Mm -hmm. I'd done nothing but diet, cut weight, be told I had to be the leanest, meanest fighting machine I could be to be competitive, had that mindset. Went into college my freshman year, Russell 167 at six foot two. And then something real unique happened to me that summer I started working out in a gym in Virginia Beach called Waring's Gym. I'm all of a sudden introduced to a whole new world of thought, you know, heavy weights, eating all kinds of crazy meals and stuff to try to bulk up. And I started running around with a whole different group of people all of a sudden that said, well, you need to be bigger, stronger, all this. Don't worry about being a little guy. And I worked out like a madman after my freshman year of college and came back and weighed 215. Hmm. And they said, well, you're not big enough to be a heavyweight. And frankly, I wasn't because heavyweights at that time were 240, 260, 280. They were, you know, they were really big guys. And there wasn't a 220 pound class during that time. Oh. So I lost a lot of focus, a lot of interest in school because the wrestling had driven me all the way through high school. We had uh, very tough academics in school I went to. And if you didn't keep your grades up, you couldn't compete in sports. So that had driven me and was driving me through college. Well, when all of a sudden that dream kind of got shelved for me and they were telling me to go back down to 167, I got very disheartened and said, well, you know, I could be bigger than this. And I started to, to see some other possibilities for myself. And it was about that time that I started working in nightclubs in Virginia Beach as a bouncer, rogues and Peabody's and and the guys, the, the wrestlers, would come down and frequent uh, the rogues gallery where I worked after the matches. And I started seeing people like like Greg Valentine and, and uh, oh gosh, Steamboat and just a host of people and, and met a guy named Buzz Sawyer. Mm -hmm. And, and a, uh, a good friend of mine, Jimmy Cox, who was a police officer uh, in Virginia Beach back then, he took me backstage down at the Norfolk Scope one night, introduced me to Gene Anderson and, the, and the, the folks that were running the things back there at that time. And, and they said, well, come on down for a, a tryout. Well, you know, I didn't get the, I wasn't smartened up to anything going on here. I'm, I'm 225 pounds or so at the time and, and getting bigger by the day. But I mean, I'm working security in a bar. I'm dealing with knuckleheads in there and all these people. So I get down there to this tryout session that they have. Gave Gene my $500 that it took me a month to save up, you know, and gave Gene my money. And they proceeded to take us in this room and start exercising us. And I said, exercising. And I wasn't like the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I realized about 30 minutes into this thing, about 5,000 push-ups and duck squats and running people around my back, that nobody had any interest in my athletic capability whatsoever. And I remember I walked outside and I sat down on the hill out there outside of Crockett's facility. And Gene came out there all huffing and puffing. He grabbed me by the hand and said, come on back in here. Because then all of a sudden out of the woodwork, here comes Buzz Sawyer and this guy and that guy and Roop and all these guys that are, that are all fresh and all want to get in the <laughs> ring now and check out my wrestling ability. And I said, this is a bunch of BS. I'm not doing this. I remember, I remember Gene reached me and I said, come on, kid. He reached me and I pulled him back and said, no, you don't want me to go in there. I said, I'm not you know, a mark. I'm not going in there and wrestling a bunch of fresh guys and I'm blown up out of my gourd. I said, this isn't gonna work. I said, I'm sorry I've wasted your time and my time, I'm going home. And I left and I drove back to my little place in Virginia Beach and shook my head and said, man, what in the world have I gotten into here? And Buzz Sawyer kind of eased around back in the scenes as I was still going in the same areas where the guys were and said, well, I'll train you. Well. What he saw was another angle of a mark. He saw an opportunity to get some money out of me and, right. and, and say he's going to get me in the business. And so not to besmudge that whole situation, but it, it was, I kind of got taken advantage of, but to the same extent I allowed myself to because I wanted to get in bad, but I knew that there was no way in the door that I had tried to walk in mm -hmm. with Crockett's that was going to happen. And I went the total opposite end of the world. I had given him lots of money for different things that really didn't have anything to do with getting in the wrestling business as I later found out. But oh, he wow. went to Portland, Oregon. And I went down, picked up his little brother in Tampa and and dropped him off in Louisiana where he was going to work for a guy named Bill Watts. 
So I drove him and Jimmy Garvin and, and uh, Jake Roberts and all these guys around all the towns. I made the whole circuit for about a month with them, not working, just watching what was going on mm -hmm. all the time you know, in my way, but I'm just on my way to Portland. And I was, and nobody believed it. And I remember I met Grizzly Smith back then, and he said, no, you need to start wrestling right here. I said, no, I got some business with a guy up in Portland. I'm going on out there. And so Don Owens was the promoter out there, and, mm -hmm. and I kept trying to get hold of Buzz on the phone, and my mom and dad and grandpa are sending me money at Western Union, and I'm going through, you know, I'm just doing better than food stamps right now, sleeping on a couch, trying to make my way. So finally, I just decide I'm going to find him. I get his address, and I drive all the way across Texas, all the way to LA, I drive all the way up to Portland, Oregon, and I find myself there. In which case, he doesn't know exactly what to do with me, so he takes me in and introduces me to Don Owen and says, this is Terry Allen, and, and I, he's my protege, and I've trained him, <laughs> and he's gonna be, you know, he's gonna be the next great thing. I haven't been in the ring once. Oh my God. Not once. And they filmed down at a little bowling alley in, there in Portland every week, and Don's under the impression I've been working for Bill Watts and all this stuff. <laughs> so I get in the ring two times, uh, wrestle and work out with Buzz and, and Princess Victoria, who was <laughs> a wonderful Indian athlete at the time, and, uh, wow. and learned the very basics in headlock and a few little things. And then my very first match is on TV against Buzz. I go about 10, 11 minutes on television with him. And, uh, you know, it was a real, you know, different story, different startup in that that uh, this is 1980, and you know I have all these dreams and and visions of what's going on, but I was introduced from the very bottom, the ladder of this rung. So I stayed in six months in Portland, Oregon, working every night. The Barbarians started out there too. We had some of our first matches together, and if you don't think that was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you and I look like uh, Fred Astaire by comparison. And Ginger Rogers yes, compared, yeah, by, okay. by comparison of Barb and I, you know, green. They, we, well, we had a match one time, and, and Dutch Savage was a booker, and he said, I want you guys to finish it up and slam each other twice and go in the finish. Barb and I, neither one heard twice. We slammed each other about six times each until oh. we were we both blown up, fell down, got counted out, and it was over. I mean, that's the kind of things we were doing. Oh, my but gosh. I was six months there and uh, realized that, you know, there was – nothing really great gonna happen for me uh, in the Portland area and made some phone calls and and uh, I don't know exactly even how it unfolded but I ended up getting in touch with Joe Blanchard who owned the little territory down there in San Antonio and I went down there and worked for six months with him and so in a year's time though I was wrestling six days a week mm -hmm. and so I was getting a lot of ring time in experience and experience mm -hmm. and, and with old rough you know just Lord Jonathan Boyd and I mean just guys that you know you would never even have heard of but they were people that had been in the ring 20 you know 25 years so yeah. I got that experience wow. I was like I was like a little sponge I was soaking wow. it up yeah and uh, went to San Antonio Joe Blanchard you know, gave me a little you know opportunity there, but I was still just way too green to do anything besides be on a curtain jerker or kind of opening the cards. And about five months into that adventure, a fellow named Mike Graham comes in for a little spot deal. He comes in as a guest performer, and 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 we become these big big buds overnight. And he says he sees potential. He sees me now somebody that is is charismatic. You know, despite myself, don't know why, but mm -hmm. I have something special. And he calls his dad, Eddie Graham, gets him on the phone. He says, "Dad, we need to bring this kid in." You know, he you know gets people excited. We need to you know try to do something with him. And he did. He brought me to Florida, and I was a year and a half there. In what was really a great education, because Eddie Graham was a master of mm -hmm. psychology. I don't know if you even had the opportunity of meeting him I, uh, I, briefly, but and, and I've always heard, I always had heard that about Eddie that if if that he was really he knew the business. Oh, he, he, knew he did, the and he would talk to you about it as long as you would listen. So Mike and he and I traveled together exclusively, and he mm -hmm. Eddie had a plane. We flew around together, and I he would just talk to you. He would sit with you and watch all the matches and just tell you why they were doing this. He taught me the psychology of painting a picture and telling a story, the difference in, in registering a blow and dying and all, all the different mm. things and the whys and the wherefores. 
And so I got to spend time in the ring with people like Dory Funk Jr. down there and, and, and David Von Erich before he passed away. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of people that were trying to build us up and, and knew that the youth was the future of the business. Terry Funk was very helpful back in those days. And then I met American Dream Dusty Rhodes. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we formed a, a lifelong friendship, at, you know, as have you with he, and, and we became, you know, very good friends. And, and, uh, and Dusty knew that, that, you know, to continue my growth, that I was going to have to find, you know, another stepping stone, something else to give me an opportunity besides just what was going on in Florida. Ernie Ladd came in and he was booking or pseudo booker for Bill Watts at the time, and he saw me. Mid, Mid South was known for taking young talent, uh, green talent, and, and grooming them and, and building them up, like Paul Orndorff, different folks, right, right. Junkyard Dog, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, people that they made stars out of there in the Mid South. And I got that opportunity, got that call from, from Ernie, and Dusty said, Yes, you need to go. That'll be a great opportunity. And right on the cusp of all that happening, I was sitting in a breakfast shop with uh, Andre the Giant. And Andre looks over at me and he says, you are, you're ready for a break, but you need a name. And he named me Magnum T.A., sitting, oh, over, wow. sitting over breakfast wow. one morning. And his goal was to bring me up to work for Vince, not knowing that this thing was going to unfold in the Mid-South. But it, but it just didn't unfold that way. Mm -hmm. The opportunity came up there and I went to Mid-South. And the first six months of that was absolutely miserable because I had this name. I had a new opportunity but nobody really knew what to do with me and what to do with this thing. I was there six months, Ernie was a booker. There was no imagination going on. And frankly, they were, I was getting ready to leave and come back to Florida to go to work with Dusty because we had, we had a different vision in mind that him and I discussed going up and down the roads. We were gonna try to do it in Florida. Well, about that time, a guy named Bill Dundee comes in from Tennessee. This is uh, 1983. And he's got all these wild, crazy, just off the wall ideas that he's that he's brought out of Tennessee. And he hooks me up with Mr. Wrestling too, and forms this bond, kind of like you had with Ivan and you know mm -hmm. the, the Don Canoodle deal, and gets me involved in this humongous, twisted up tale of Wrestling Two as my coach and my mentor, and then him and I splitting and having this big feud, and it brought me from where I was at, a middle of the card guy in Florida, to an opportunity of working main events, main event mm -hmm. angles, lots of television time, lots of interview time, lots of ring time with people like Butch Reed and Ted DiBiase and, and people that were really able to take me to another level. Wow. So when I get the call and the opportunity to come to this, back to mid-Atlantic, I've circumnavigated the globe, <laughs> You know, and I've had about 3,000 yeah. matches, and I've been hearing about this monster. And, and it's so funny because when you do television, you've got there's little crews of guys that run around, and that's all they are. They're cannon fodder that gets thrown out at all these different television tapings, and they go to they go to Atlanta, they go to the Mid South, they go they go down to Georgia, and the guys I remember they kept coming and shaking their heads. They said they got a real Russian, a real Russian down there in the Carolinas and you're not going to believe it till you see it. And I'm shaking my head. I'm going, man, they're all marks. <laughs> and all these guys are marks. <laughs> and they're talking about this ferocious, big monster, blah, 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 all this stuff. <sighs> and I'll never forget, Dusty gives me the call and says, I need help. Uh, they brought Barry Windham in to be their big push, star baby face. And, and things weren't working out the way Barry wanted at the time. And he powders and goes to New York. And Dusty mm -hmm. and and Jimmy were all just, you know, left there shaking their heads, didn't know what to do. The Ter the Carolinas hadn't been popped at all. You were right. there. It was right. very, very, you know, tough times, and everybody was really having to dig in deep to go out there and, and put on a good show mm -hmm. in front of very sparse crowds. And and in con and by contrast, there I am in in the mid south, and we're doing twenty thousand dollar houses every night. I had my first hundred thousand dollar year in nineteen eighty three. Wow. And and here I'm going to tell Bill Watts, I'm giving him my notice. And he could not believe it. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, you know his personality. He's type A personality guy. And, and you know, he's just so sure of himself. And for this guy who he felt like he'd made a star, giving me a great opportunity, which he did. And he right. taught me a lot as well as had Eddie Graham. Never take that away from him. I look at him and I say, it's time for me to do this thing. And I remember talking to Jimmy on the phone and Jimmy said, 
you know, how much are you making? I said, two grand a week. He said, well, I can't guarantee you two grand a week, but I promise you, if you come out here, I'll give you the greatest opportunity of your life and you'll never have a paycheck less than $700. Mm -hmm. All I wanted was an opportunity because right. I, I knew Dusty, I knew his creative talents. My lifelong dream had been to come back, wrestle in Norfolk Scope in front of my sure. parents, my yeah. grandfathers who were huge fans and all that stuff. Wow. And, and I knew that it was a chance, but packed it all up. I worked a six week notice for Bill. Bill just beat me, brow beat me to death. Every, every TV taping, he talked to the guys, used me as an example, you know, what an idiot I was for, you know, leaving this grand opportunity. And off I came to, to the land of milk and honey, you know, back, back, yeah. back home. And, uh, you know, it, walking in there and seeing that operation, uh, I remember, you know, I remember vividly, I'm sure you do too, the months of wondering, I remember looking at Dusty, we're, we're driving down there and I said, you know, Something's got to happen here pretty soon. <laughs> you know, oh, I, you know, oh, I remember. You know, I was, you know, 500 people in Columbia doesn't look very good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, well, before you came, there were 50 people in Columbia yes. when I first came to the territory. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, many a night, 50, uh, 50 people in Lynchburg, Virginia, and, and you know, 75 Roanoke, people here. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. it was. And, and driving all those places, people you know, have a hard time comprehending the fact we were in our own cars. We're driving 100,000 plus miles a year. Right. We're, you know, y'all, it's a great tax write-off. Well, you know, first three years, I qualified for food stamps. <laughs> you know, I didn't break $20,000 a year for the first three years. <laughs> yeah, great tax write-off. You know, you reminded me of another reason why, why I had, uh, was not wrestling was not appealing to me back in those high school and college days you, you know you mentioned about about dieting and you know keeping at 167 all that. that that was another reason why at, in, in that part of my life why wrestling didn't appeal to me because I, I watched some of my buddies emaciated uh, oh you know in the lunchroom and whatnot you know trying to you know to starve themselves and put on those rubber suits and, and yeah. run and go into the sweat box and steam rooms and, and all that stuff and, and a few of them played football. And, and not that the wrestling coach didn't try to get me out there, because he did. He, he tried to get In fact, I remember one year, he was also my PE teacher. <laughs> and, and Pete Grigelko. I'll never forget the guy's name. You know how you remember just some good negative stuff? Man, I'll never forget, man. He put me against Matt Johnson, who was the heavyweight for the wrestling team. And we had an awesome wrestling team. We, we had... Uh, I, I've, what do you have? Ten guys on a team, roughly. I mean, yeah, as far 10, as twelve guys, yeah. ten, twelve guys. Yeah. I mean, but as far as those, and, and I mean, I want to say without exaggeration that like seven out of the ten qualified for like state tournament. I mean, we awesome, had yeah. we had awesome wrestling teams, but I just had no interest in. It. And, and man, I remember one one year, man, he, we were in a fight class and we were having a, like a six week wrestling course, and, and he was determined that uh, Gugelko, the coach, was determined that that Matt Johnson and I were going to have a three minute wrestling match during PE. Man, I, 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 short of just, you know, bailing out of class and just not showing up, you know, which I did a few times, but he was determined before the course is over, I was going to wrestle Matt. And I'll never forget, uh, I was, uh, uh, I, I, I finally was man enough to show up. I said, all right. And in my mind, though, I said, this guy may be, a, you know, you know, heavyweight champion, you know, district champion, all this stuff. But but this dude's not putting me on my back. I don't, I don't care what I have to do. I'm not going on my back. And I'll never forget, man, he blew that whistle. And, and, and I just went into a, a four-point stance, man, on my feet and my hands. And every time Matt tried to shift, man, I just counterbalanced my weight, man. And, and, he, and he, I would tell you what, he tried like crazy to, to, to turn me over in, for three minutes. But, but he never did. He never did. <laughs> I believe that, too. And, and, oh, he, and I'm telling you, and, 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 and Grigelko, the, the, the coach and PE teacher, he was just, he was so mad, mad at Matt, mad that I wouldn't go out for the team. But I just said, but, but that dieting thing, man, I'm like, uh-uh, man, I, I no. enjoy eating too much. I enjoy too yeah. much food. Yeah. But uh, had I known then what I know now about nutrition, I'd have come out of high school weighing, you know, 200, 210 pounds. Just didn't know. I mean, what we thought about dieting and carb cutting and all the goofy things that were a trend right. you know, back in the 70s, right. we know now are bad for you, you know, and things that you shouldn't do. And. And you know it's just progress and and it is and, and all those things. But it well know. and 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 so you know leading back to those early days when when you came into territory, uh, that just we can kind of catapult off that because we were like 
Uh, starving then too. See, we, yes, we, we were, uh, you guys were starving. So, I, I left the steak and came over there with you guys. <laughs> who got? So I'm, I'm thinking here, who got the last lie? Here, I'm laughing at get these guys starving in high school because they had to cut all this weight, and then I'm driving in the in the Carolinas, like you said, you know, putting on a couple thousand plus miles a week. People don't realize two thousand plus miles a week in a car. I mean, easily that that we're driving, you know, with the guarantee, you know, that we'd make fifty bucks. You know, that was the guarantee. People don't realize fifty dollars was our guarantee that on any given night if we made nothing else we'd make 50 bucks and then of course when we did tv taping it was only 40 bucks because they were doing us the favor of putting us on tv right. never mind was that, we were was our advertising back then, yeah right? that was our advertising and, and so uh, so of course you know as you know we're driving up up and down the roads uh, uh you, you know experiencing that uh, you know where i'm you know, and you and I didn't communicate a whole lot at, at that point because you're on one side of the tracks. You know, you're, right. you're a baby face. Yeah, we gave Faye big time back Yeah, time. back then, it, you know, it, it wasn't, yeah, you just did. I mean, you, we, we were trained by old school guys like you were talking about. You know, Ivan Koloff was a, a, and, and, and Kernodal and some of the other guys I worked with, but Ivan and Don specifically were, were tremendous at teaching me. Uh, like you had these guys who taught you the psychology of the business and some, some legendary guys that worked with you. And, you know, I had, I had Kernodal and, and, and Ivan training me, you know, every night, uh, you know, getting to the town early and whatnot, and teaching me the psychology of the business. And Ivan sitting, you know, in my corner and, and watching my match and then myself sitting in Ivan's corner and watching their world tag team match. And then, you know, we'd be in the car and, and we'd be, you know, that's where I'd talk, you know, I, I, and that's what we did back then, and that is right, because we had that time, and it wasn't just a party. It was a time of analysis and what would made this better and, and why this happened and why it would have been better if this had happened. And, you know. Right, absolutely. And, and so, you know, in learning that, that whole aspect of the business uh, for me, and, and I was very fortunate from essentially from day one, one, to be under the wing of an Ivan Koloff and a Don Cronon and guys that, and then of course when Dusty came in the territory uh, and, and some other, you know, working with, opportunities to work with the Rock and Roll Express and work with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and, and begin to work with some of these that, that I was thrust in a sense in, into a, a, a main event uh, role almost essentially from day one that I either had, I was either going to sink or swim. One or the other, and fortunately for me, I, you know, I was like a, a duck to water, and 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 it, to the point of, you know, I, I, I chuckle because I've had other people tell me. In fact, Darso Barry Darso was in the Louisiana territory working with Nikolai Volkov, right. doing kind of a turncoat kind of thing. He was another guy that told me that the word was going around there that they've got this real Russian up in the Carolinas, and of course, when Darso finally found out it was me. You know, he said, man, I should have known. So, you know, a lot of people don't know that, that they, you know, Darso and myself and Ravishing Rick Rude and, you know, God rest his soul and, and, and Kurt Henning, God rest his soul, that, that there were seven of us from my, from my high school that all, all made it in pro wrestling. Seven of us. And five of the seven, at one point, were on the same high school football team. Mm. And, and Z-Man Tom Zink and... and uh, Nord the Barbarian, and the least known was, was wrestled as Brady Boone, and then also yeah. did some, which you knew Brady, and he did some refereeing later and stuff. But, and, and interestingly enough, other than Kurt Henning, who was on the wrestling team, whose father, Larry the Axe Henning, wrestled, you know, I don't even know that in high school he even entertained the idea of, because I know he wanted to play, he, I know he had an interest, interest to play pro football, but injuries led him in a different direction too, which he right. ended up in, in pro wrestling. Right. But, um, and so I chuckle uh, when, when I hear the guys say that, that, you know, the word within the business, guys who were smart to the business were saying, Man, there's this real rushing up there. Because when I broke in, you know, I, anything I've ever done, and, and even in working with you and, and knowing your work ethic as we began to work together, and, and even when we were at that point working at angles together or anything, Watching you work, that we had very similar type work ethic, and anything the, I've ever... the intensity yes. that we shared was was something that everyone didn't have. That that was one of the things that really, when it finally did come together, made it so big. It, right, it just catapulted it. I, I felt to a whole different level, because um, I just felt in in my mind, in in as I was learning the business, that okay, I'm doing this, I'm having some success with it. And so if I'm going to really be successful, if this is the road I've chosen and it looks like it's going to be the career that's, 
you know, and, and didn't give a second thought to, to pro football at that point because everything just happened so fast. Right. It was just steamrolling. And I'm also I'm in main event matches and, and working with these top guys and, you know, superstars of the wrestling business that, that I want to give it everything I have. So, so I, I went and got the Russian workbooks and, and started studying, you know, you know, Uncle Yadia Ivan, Uncle Ivan, and, and oh, das Vadania, you know, Spakona Noche, you know, good night, you know, goodbye, and, you know, uh, and, and so started learning these little phrases and words and started learning to sign my name in Russian and, 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 and made a decision not to speak anywhere outside the arena and, and, and carried it to the, to the nth degree where I flew back home to Minnesota and, and, and legally changed my name. You know, people ask me all the time, you know, is, your, is that really your name, Nikita Koloff? Well, yeah. And they're like, no. But then they'll go, with the, sometimes they'll go with the name. But were you born Nikita Koloff though? You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, you didn't ask me that. Yeah, you just exactly. asked if Nikita Koloff was really my name. Yeah. Well, no, I wasn't born yeah. Nikita Koloff. But and that, it's funny because that's where I say Nikita Koloff was born without me being there. It's really true. When, when, when Slaughter and Konoto came up with the original idea, presented it to Ivan, Ivan loved it. That, so Nikita was born without me being there. And then I just stepped into that role and, and then just made the decision to make the most of it. And so, so of course, as, as my career began to accelerate and, and you're in now and, and, and we start seeing a few things happen, um, you know, leading up to the point of, 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 of you know, you and I beginning to, to entertain the idea of, of working together and, and working, working the angle, which, which ultimately culminated in, in the best of seven series, which I thought was brilliant. Oh, yeah, at the time. Absolutely. And, and, you know, they had they groomed you and they brought you to a place and you had been so guarded, you know, in, in your infancy of learning the business and learning the ropes and and never put in any bad lights. And that's very difficult to do. I had the luxury of learning the ropes where I wasn't seen. I wasn't under the watchful eye of the world because I was in all these little remote territories. Right. It didn't matter right. if I'd done 5,000 jobs or one job. Nobody had ever seen it. And when I came to the Mid-Atlantic and when we burst onto the Superstation, it was like everybody said, where did this Magnum TA guy come from? Nobody knew about Mid-South. They didn't know about this career that I'd had out there. They didn't know that I'd had all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of matches. They didn't know any of that because it was like a fresh character just written into a script that all of a sudden came to life on a television screen. And that's what the what created, you know, this imagination for people about, you know, what is this new rising star? You know, you know, you you worked all those, you know, hundreds of hours in the gym to build this body. All of a sudden they bring you in as a Russian nightmare. You're fresh, you're new. And it was it would have would not have worked any other way. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything came together there in such a way that there would not have been the uniqueness if you had been, you know, they'd been training you for six months and some little deal. It would have got out in the sheets. Somebody would have known about it. There'd been some little scuttlebutt. But as it was, you were an enigma and your dedication to protecting this persona that they'd created for you was was what superseded your lack of ring experience and right. and you know those type things you overcompensated so well by protecting the persona and being that character 24/7 that that's what opened the door for the things that happened that we were able to you know capitalize on absolutely in fact uh, I've got a good friend of mine Gene Legan who who you know and and He's told me a story a couple different times that he, he, just how protected you know my character was. You know, he said they they came to him and they said you're going to be wrestling you know Nikita Koloff and and uh, he said I'll never forget that that first time because they, they came to me and they said he doesn't go off his feet. If you take him off his feet, you're fired. He does not. And he said I, and and I remember getting in the ring with you and. And backing into the corner, and, and I want to give you give you like like a beal out of the corner, like a hip toss out of the corner. He said, and, and you took it, and and I, I thought, oh my gosh, my my career's over. <laughs> he said, he said, I just freaked out because I thought, oh, he went off his feet. Oh no, I'm fired. I'm fired. And, and but what he didn't know was, you know. I didn't know any better. I mean, I, you know, I'm thinking, okay, the guy's giving me the, well, all right, here we go, you know. And, and so uh, and it was fun, but, but it was protected in, in that sense. So, 
so that when when the two of us you know would would finally square up and again the fans are watching your intensity level they're they're seeing my intensity level that you're right it it just set the stage for the two of us and 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 you know the the height of the cold war I mean, the, the yeah. timing element of all of this is just absolutely amazing because you're, you're still essentially at the height of the Cold War. And uh, so, you know, you had that, that look of, of, you know, apple pies, hot dogs, you know, the, that all-American look, if you will. And, and here I had this, this you know, if, if not just the name, the Russian nightmare, just the, the intimidation factor, the look, and, and that whole persona. But what couldn't have really made better chemistry in terms of an angle, uh, I don't know that there is anything that could have. And no. so the timing is just abs was absolutely amazing to me. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you remember back before we popped the territory and things, and we got on the Superstation, but I remember early on in, when, when things were just struggling and we had Cowboy Ron Bass and Dick Slater and these different characters. Black and our, Bart. Yeah, and yeah. I remember, you know, us being, you know, we were actually worked together uh, before I started my program with Ric Flair and before Tully and I in tag team type situations, we'd had some contact, but things, I mean, the territory hadn't popped. We'd like mm -hmm. cross paths just briefly. Uh, and it was always just something very brief, but I remember working with Dick Slater as my partner and you and Ivan and just a little thing in, in Charlotte one time. And it was just very, you know, nothing, no direction, wasn't an angle, was just a card. That yeah, just booked. a match on the card. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. To look, and then to look within a period of, you know, 12 months, how something would then culminate into one of the biggest one-on-one -on -one collisions. Because frankly, it was, it was a stroke of genius because the, con the confrontation, the program that I worked with Tully was so intense and culminating in the, the I quit match and the, the, just the full-blown intensity of that was so large that what followed that was very important for my career. And it wasn't time for me to jump back into the program with Flair. You know, Dusty was doing his run with Flair, and it was just such right timing. And it was a big concern for me because this was gonna be the first time in my career that I was gonna be the most experienced one in the ring. I mean, the right. very oh, first yeah. time I'd always been in there was <laughs> always been in there with someone who had at least five years of experience, if not oh, more. Wow. And so for me, this was a real test of immense proportion in my mind, thinking, okay, you know, I've been in all these situations, and yes, I've contributed, as you do, and as we all do when we're in the ring, but there's always been someone, a general, that's dictated the tempo of what's going on, and I haven't had to do anything but be on autopilot. It's been very nice, relaxed, as long as I can, you know, as I can flow, and as right. long as I can follow Fred Astaire, I'm gonna have a great match. Right. And so that was a very unique time for me as a five-year, you know, then veteran of the business to be the experienced one all of a sudden. Right, because I think I maybe had, at best, maybe a, maybe a year and a half, at the most, two yeah. years. At the, at, the at the most. At the most. I'm thinking maybe even just a year and a half. And probably not a lot of our Broadways at that time. Or No. 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 <laughs> it, I'd say definitely, especially early on, the, you know, it, one or two minutes, many of the matches lasted, and, and uh, we yeah. might stretch it into 10 minutes if, if uh, Ivan and I were wrestling the Rock and Roll Express or something. But uh, yeah, so, so definitely not a, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of time under my belt, so to speak. So yeah, that, I mean, that was... Uh, it had to be a little nerve-wracking for you, too. Well, from the sense that, that you know, as like you, you know, I, even though I'm working heel, I'm, I'm working with guys that, that are, are well more experienced than me. So, again, uh, so I'm an autopilot in a sense that all I've got to do is listen to. You know, if I just, if I can just listen and follow that lead, then, then I'm good to go. I'm in good shape. So I, I would, I would say we both were, were definitely treading some uh, some new it was, waters. Yeah, or it was, it was new, some new it, waters. It was some it was. new territory there. Yeah, without a doubt. But we had good people around us, you know, wanting it to be good. But I thought I remember vividly what I, I, I have lots of memories, as I'm sure you do, of that best of seven that must have turned into the best of ten or eleven or twelve before it was all over with. Uh, it, well, and I still have people to this day, to the, years later, and I know you do too. And, that, that when I'm out and, and I'm talking to fans or, or, you know, be it wherever, it doesn't have to be some 
memorabilia thing. I mean, just be out anywhere and somebody right. will strike up a conversation. One of the things, if not the most, the thing I hear most comments from, from people is the best of sex. I mean, it had never been done before, to, to my knowledge. No. You know, other than, of course, in baseball, <laughs> yeah. you know, the World Series. And, and so the fact that it had never been done before, I think, was a totally new concept for the fan. And then the way we orchestrated the whole event, you know, going up, going up three, three zip, you know, three nothing. And, and oh yeah, thinking I was just going to get blown out of the water. Yeah, just thinking, you know, the, I'm just this. And then we have a couple of them on television. Yeah, well, the number seven, the the, the seventh and final one was uh, we did 45 minutes. They they taped it live in Charlotte. That was going to air on the Mid Atlantic program, right? We we essentially we had the whole entire program that, which is unheard of. I mean, a one hour program, and, and our match essentially consumed the whole entire show for that weekend. Was was the seventh and final one because you know as you know leading up you know going up three nothing and 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 then you know you inching your way back you know the the three one three two tying it up three three and. And of course, all of that just piqued so much interest among the fans as to who is going to win now that seventh and deciding match. Um, and then to have it happen in Charlotte was uh, was certainly a, a bonus as well, being you know kind of considered the, the base, the hub of everything that happened in for Mid Atlantic Wrestling. And uh, no, I you know I I'm just I, I'm amazed in a, sometimes that the recollection of the fan that they that they that it stuck uh, vividly enough in their minds the best of seven series that that's something that they would bring up more often than 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 anything else for me on my perspective well it, it depicted such a struggle of, of you know of their in their mind good versus evil or the underdog and the bully you know all the things that people could relate to in their own life and you know you know from watching the business today as opposed to in our era you know, we we did the interviews, you know, talking into the camera. We, you know, we looked into that camera and that person sitting on that couch or in front of their television felt such a connection because of the intensity level was so high. We're staring bullet holes through this lens. And I mean, there's not any doubt in their mind that when this event comes and when this confrontation comes down, that they're part of it. I mean, it was a struggle that they felt a part of. Absolutely. And, uh, you, you know, uh, I, I tell you, one, one of the... Let's do a stop because that train's going to come over here. Okay, we're here back with part two of the uh, the conversation with Magnum TA and Nikita Koloff. Nikita, you were you were in the middle of, of telling us something. We got interrupted by a little train here, so if you want to just pick up where we were at. No, I was just thinking, uh, you know, a couple of... A couple of things that, that come to memory with, with uh, Magnum even outside of the best of seven series is, uh, as I said earlier, really as, as brilliant a concept as I thought that was and, and how well it went over with the fans. Uh, two, two other matches that, that stick out in my mind. One, one of course, was, was in your hometown. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't recall it being one of the best, best of seven, but I think it was just a match we were working along in, in the program. Or maybe one of those and, chain uh, matches? No, it was it, it wasn't a chain match, but the chain did become involved. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, although it wasn't a chain match, uh, no, we we were just we were having a match. Ivan was in my corner, as you know, as Uncle Uncle Ivan, you know, always was, and um, we uh, this would be uh, several times through my career I experienced uh, firsthand uh, wrestling fans uh, within the the squared circle. Is that where just, I looked up and saw more boots in the ring that was supposed to be there? <laughs> that 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 would have most likely have been that time. And you know we're 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 in we're in Magnum's hometown and and and, uh, and, and you know I've got we've got him down. And, and, and what happened is is Baron von Roski exactly hit the ring as well. So it's it's Uncle Ivan, the Baron, and myself three on one in uh, in Magnum's hometown. And and this man takes it upon himself to decide to come and help defend you, and I, I catch him out of the corner of my eye and coming through coming through the ropes. He's not not a a big guy by any stretch of the imagination, but 
you know, in in those days, you you know, you never knew. you heard the stories of you know Ole Anderson getting sliced, you know, from from here to here by a knife and you know by a fan, and you hear the different stories. And so I'm like like not taking any chances here. I'm like not you know I, I does he have some I I don't care whether he does or doesn't at this point. He's coming through the ring. Here we go. And I'll never forget he, he came through and. Of course, I met him in, in, with with a with a pretty stiff boot to the stomach, which would be of no surprise to you because everything I did was stiff. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, you know, I met him with a stiff, and he went down. And, and so I, in, in the meantime, Ivan and the Baron were over on you, and and I turned to come back over, and I look, and the guy's getting up again. I'm like, all right. So I go back, and and boom, I, I give him another boot. He goes down again. I'm like, okay, that should do it. A little bit harder this time. And I look, and he's getting up a third time. And I'm like, this is crazy. So. I went and got my chain and, and, and gave him a third boot and he went down and only this time I said, I, I, I hailed Ivan and Baron, I said, hold this guy down. And, and I proceeded to take the chain and wham, and, and just, you know how we used to, but we used to work it, or at least attempt to work it when we were whipping each other or whatever, and yeah. the chain would come across us. But, but I wasn't really working this one, and I, <laughs> boom, and, and across the guy's head. Well, he stayed down. I'm like, okay, that's. <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> I don't know. See, I don't even know if you. I don't know if you remember any of this, or, no. or you were just down selling. I was, and, even... and, and all I know, I remember looking up and I said, there's too many feet in here. I was, I, there's supposed to be three people, there's eight feet. <laughs> yeah, and, and, <laughs> oh, right. And, and, uh, and so the guy stayed down, and, and I threw the chain down to proceed back to the finish of our match, what we're supposed to do, because ultimately the baby face is supposed to hit the ring and run us out, and, and ultimately they, they do. The baby faces end up hitting the ring, and, and of course, the, the cops never did anything, because in their mind, it was part this of the guy's match. part of the deal, right? And, and so when the baby faces hit the ring, we powder, I'm looking around and I'm like, I, I'm not, like, not seeing my chain anywhere, and I'm like, oh my gosh, so the, another fan got my chain. Well, and no, another fan didn't get my chain. All the cops get around us because the people are livid. You know, we're in your hometown, three on one. Guy tries to hit the ring, tries to help you. He's down. You know, all these. And so they're livid. I mean, they're throwing, they're tossing beer on us, spitting on us, and, you know, telling us we're number one in their hearts. And <laughs> yeah. just, you know, the, just the, all kinds of compliments they're slinging yeah. our way. And, and, and as we we're starting to, to make our way, all the cops around us, we're starting to make our way out of, uh, up the aisle, I see the shortest cop there who looks to be about four foot five and, and, and about 200 pounds. In his hand, I see my chain. I'm like, oh, good, okay, he got the chain. But then he starts in on me, the cop, and says, I'm gonna get you for assault with a deadly weapon, all this. He starts saying to me as we're walking up the aisle, and I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, Dude, I'm just defending myself here. You know, it, I, you know, I mean, it should be obvious. I, I, you know, the guy kept getting up, kept coming, kept coming, and and he's going on and on. Well, never breaking character, as as of course never I did. I, I looked at him and I went, Uncle Robert, the other Mindy Stobria, the Amerikanski, you know, just spouting off all this Russian because I don't want to break character to these cops or anybody. That's just my mentality, right? And, but he just keeps going, assault with a deadly weapon, you know. This, uh, well, we get back to the dressing room, and, and, and Mernix are the promoters, and, and uh, Mernick comes in. I'm like, I'm like, hey, I want my chain back. I want it now. You know, this, this guy thinks he's going to, you know, I just defended myself here. And he's like, oh, get, you know, let me. Well, a half hour later, you know, taking a shower, getting the shower, and, and here he comes. Well, okay, I got him calmed down. And, and uh, I don't know if you ever, I don't know if you had ever heard know. the. Well, and I don't know if you ever heard the the, the, the the end of the story. The whole, you know, that was the high spot in, in the the finish of the story, because um, weeks later, and maybe maybe a couple months later, Myrna came to me, and we were back up there, and and he came to me, and said, "Hey, did you hear what happened to that to that guy?" I'm like, "What what guy?" He said, "Well, you remember the one that you know attacked you in the ring?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "Well, he said he went to court." A couple days ago, and I said, "Really?" And they, he said, "Yeah, they they did end up arresting him that night for coming in the ring." And I said, well, good. Well, that's what they should have done in the first place. Yeah, should have grabbed him. Threatened me. They're going <laughs> to, you know, this little guy trying to, little stubby guy trying to make a name for himself with a badge, you know, on his chest. And uh, he said, yeah, he went to court. And, and, and the judge, you know, pulls, reading through his stuff there. And, and he asks the guy, I'll never forget, he says, do you have anything to say for yourself? It turns out the guy was, was in the Navy, stationed there in the Navy, you know, military guy. And, and of course, she had had a, a, a few too many bottles of courage that night, you know, yeah. a few too many cervezas. And, uh, 
and, and as the judge reads it over, he, he says, do you have anything to say for yourself? And he says, well, uh, yes, sir, as a matter of fact, I do. I, 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 I really feel justice was served in the ring that night, sir. And, and so as, as the judge reads it over, he reads that the guy was actually taken to the hospital for a concussion where, where, I, where I'd whacked him with the chain over the head. He was taken to the hospital for a concussion. And, and, uh, and the judge looks it over and he says, yeah, I, be I believe you're right. I believe justice was served that night. Don't ever do that again. Don't ever, you know, get in another. And he said, yes, sir, yes, sir. And so that, that, was, that, that was a high spot for me because, you know, I, I had guys attack me in the ring, fans, uh, a handful of times. But that was, if you want to call it a memorable one, was, was, was against, it was only two guys. It was either you or Flair that they attacked me, uh, but in your hometown. And that, that's one match that really uh, comes to memory and sticks out in my mind is one that I will, will not forget in a long time. And then, then the other one was in Cincinnati, Ohio at, at the, one of the uh, Great American Bashes. And, and this might, I, I think this was one of the best of seven. <clears throat> um, and, and they called the uh, you know, they asked for me to get get color that night, which which you know I wasn't a, a yeah, huge huge on the I wasn't huge on the color scale. You know, I, I, they could they could ask me to get color, but but they couldn't dictate like how much. So I figured if a trickle was coming down, you know, that, that I had sufficiently fulfilled what they had asked me to do. And well, on this particular night, things just kind of and I and again, you may or may not remember this, but but this particular night, I I missed the mark, uh, so to speak. And in fact, still, if someone were to look close, they would, they would actually kind of see uh, the, the vein that I had cut, cut myself across and, and was, was crimson. In fact, a few of the magazines actually were able to capture this, that I was crimson from, from head to toe, uh, uh, literally crimson, red from head to toe. And I'll, I'll never forget when the match concluded, it was in the, I'm in the dressing room. And trying to get this thing stopped. I mean, it just would squirting. Oh, yeah, it, it yeah. just it just pouring, just gushing. Would not stop. And um, and so I I finally got it stopped after after sitting there for I don't know how long, just putting pressure on this thing, right? So you know, here we go. I'm ready to go take a shower. I go in the shower, and uh, yeah, I, I I bend over to pick some you know bar soap up off the floor, and I no sooner bend over than that that pressure. <laughs> Just start shooting like, like a gusher again. And I'm like, gee, now I'm in the shower, now I'm crimson again in the shower trying to get this stuff stopped, you know. Well, obviously, eventually, of course, you know, we're too macho to go get stitches or anything like that. Oh, yeah, so, tape. Yeah, a little, little yeah, butterfly tape. tape, just tape it up, you know. And, and we did that. And, of course, you, you had a field day with it the next few nights that we worked together because all, all you had to do was just, like, tap it then. <laughs> and it was pretty cool from that standpoint because – because the fan would just, you know, just see it just basically kind of tapping and, and it start, and they'll go, wow, you know, even the ones who thought, well, I know these guys cut themselves. He's like, man, his hands never went near his head. And he's, wow. So it gave a real, again, yeah. just that yeah. much added sense of believability yeah. uh, to our matches. Because one other thing I hear people say, I've had fans tell me over the years, is, is, and those who were diehard and, and, and really didn't know it was all entertainment at that time. Right. <clears throat> One of the things that I've always heard him say or, or many times is they'd walk out of the arena. And, and, and this is just a compliment to you and I as far as I'm concerned because they said they'd walk out of the arena and they, 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 and they go, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if wrestling's real or not. And I don't know about all those other matches. That match with Magnum Nikita tonight, man, that was real. That yeah, match right. was real. But and again, I think it's just a, a tribute well, that goes back to our level of intensity. And that, and that was the goal. Worked well together. That, that was the goal. You know, I mean, you know, people, it, it, it evolved into something, you know, everybody wanted to be the showstopper, steal the show, have the best match on the card. You know, that, that was something, just a level of professionalism that, that a lot of people in that era wanted to have. But my thing because of the Eddie Grahams, because of the Bill Watts, because of that solid foundation that you know we were battling in and what we were depicting, that was my goal. I wanted everyone to think that whatever I was involved in, it was you know this I was in a gunfight, you know, period. Right. And that it, that you know, 
that I was always, you know, fighting from the bottom up, whatever it took. But that depiction of how tough it was and that grit for them to feel it was, you know, what it was, you know, so special. And I think, you know, I think on it today and, you know, and I don't know that the era, you know, progress, you can't ever turn back the hands of time. But that era, because, you know, we did have, you know, color and did the things that we did to, de to depict the sheer brutality of what was taking place is lost today in in the you know the very athleticism you know the high flying and and just outlandish things people do but it didn't take as much back then to convince someone that your body had gone through something horrendous you didn't have to fall off a 10-story building it was something so focal that they could feel it they were sitting on the edge of their seat when i hit you when you hit me when the sweat flew the people felt the pulse of that. It was a different thing. Yeah, that was, and, and of course, that was the art of the business was was to, to portray that sense of realism to the point that that fan, even if they thought they, even if they thought they were smart, or or, it, and when I say smart, that that okay, this is not real. It's entertainment or whatnot. That we portrayed such a sense of realism that they almost to a degree couldn't deny the fact that it, it was indeed real. Exactly. And, 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 and I would have to agree with you that in today's day and time, today's era, because the way it has evolved and becoming known as, as sports entertainment and, and that sort of thing, that that's a kind of a, a dying art in a sense. That I, I taking nothing away from these guys' athletic ability, like, like you said, no, not at all. and the things that they're able to do. But for that fan to to sit there and to and to really be, and to, to really draw them in, it's one thing to entertain them, yeah. but it's another thing. The the art for you and I was to draw them in, and, and that they became. You talked about doing the interview that came into their home, looking into the camera. Right. You know, and the interview was one thing, but for them to be in an arena or even watch on TV, I've had people that have told me that you know their grandma, grandfather was on on the edge of their seat, like in their living room, you know, just because you know. Because it just it just drew them in, yeah. and I, you know, for me, I, I'm convinced. Nobody ever convinced me otherwise. And I've said to, to fans and, and people many places that it was an era that you and I had the privilege of being uh, of, of. of being a part of. Yeah. That never again. I, I just personally don't believe it'll ever. They could even remanufacture that. Even though wrestling. It, 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 even though life in, in general is, it, you know, everything comes back around, you know, whether it's bell-bottom jeans or, right. or or whatever, everything seems to come back around. Even in wrestling, uh, you know, things come back around. But I don't, I just don't believe that they can ever remanufacture that era of what we had in that period of time through through the 80s. So, no, because, you know, just the sheer mechanics of what it takes to paint the picture to tell the story that happens in a 15 20 minute match society as a whole is a fast food society they want to mm -hmm. zip up 15 seconds make an order get what they want get satisfied get their next thing and then they're on to the next thing we've got 350 channels on television and nothing to watch people channel surfing right. can't keep their attention and hence you know wrestling has always been a barometer of what people want in society. Right. You know, we really never dictate them. We found what they want. We found what they were craving. We gave it to them. That was always a little niche. And it was always kind of on the cutting edge. You know, Vince McMahon took it to a whole nother level because he pushed every outlandish button imaginable. Back in the day, back in the, the late seventies or early eighties, that would all be considered hot shotting. We mm -hmm. would talk about all oh, the people in Tennessee, how they'd hot shot and they killed their territory. They had these crazy matches and they did all this crazy stuff and they made a carnival out of it. And so they had no longevity. Well, he took it to a whole new level because he encompassed a fan that was never a traditional wrestling fan and just brought them this sports entertainment package that he marketed to kids and toys and all these other things but the true art form of it like you know the Ole Andersons and the Ric Flairs and the people that came up the Dory Funk Juniors the Jack Briscoes the, the people that had paid their dues learned this art form that came back from George Hackenschmidt and all the guys from over history 
You know, that won't ever happen again. It won't just because we have evolved into a new animal. We like something different for entertainment. People aren't going to go back to turning their TVs off and reading books for entertainment either. So, right. I mean, we're in right. a whole different world. And, you know, personally, you know, I know that uh, I have a great deal of pride over even though, I mean, my in the ring career was only six years. Mm -hmm. You know, six years. Uh, you know, worked in the industry in the color commentating capacity. You know, after my accident in 1986, which we ought to touch on because, of course, that was a huge, you know, that was the next evolution of Nikita Koloff. You right, know, absolutely. And, and I mean, just an absolutely. incredible thing that took place. And, you know, I laid flat on my back in, in October 14th, 1986 in the hospital, you know, not knowing whether I was going to live, walk, what was going to happen. But while I was there, even though all these physical challenges were going on, I, you know, I remember Jackie Crockett coming rigging up this TV in my room over top of my bed. I had this rotokinetic bed and he had this TV right in front of my face so I could see what was going on. Yeah. And I watched, the, I watched wrestling evolve almost before my eyes. Mm. I watched this transformation, them turning new baby face, stepping in, something that could never been predicted, could never be duplicated again. Because you, you know, to have two people in that magnitude, in that position, have that horrendous of a thing happen and an opportunity like that is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I agree. Period. But then to watch the business, pay-per-view, marketing, the thing exploded. You know, when Nikita and I started and watched it pop, you know, our position was, you know, if you made two, two hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that era, that was you were a millionaire. I mean, that mm -hmm. was that was the moon and stars. That same position, just by lieu of what took place over a period of about twelve to 24 months rotated it to where a $200,000 a year position was almost an entry level position because all of a sudden television was generating money putting it in the wrestlers pockets. All of a sudden all these things, pay-per-view things that we would have never dreamed of giving away right. on a television show was the norm right. and the house show wasn't. And it just all reversed itself in a way that Dusty and I, and I'm sure you and the guys running up down the road, you know, we thought about the evolution of it, but I literally laid in a hospital bed watching these things happen for five months and watched it evolve like a clock turning. And, and I just said, how in the world could this have gone from just in the blink of an eye from a, you know, a multi-million dollar business to a billion dollar industry. Right. And that's what took place. Yeah, it did. And, and you know, uh, you know, for for my career to, you know, be this this you know stoic nightmare, you know, heel, you know, most hated at one point and all that, and 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 turn that overnight, literally overnight. You know, I was in Japan, you know, wrestling in Japan when when that had happened, and and I, my first night back was in Philadelphia when when Jim Crockett and, and Dusty had, had told me about it, and and you know, when you when you're in the business and you know. It, at first, you know, I mean, I, I thought it was a rib, you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah you know, because that's just how you are in the business. Sure. And they're like, no, no, we're, you know, this is, you know, this is serious. And, and, uh, and then they laid out the idea of, of, of the switch, you know, the, you know, uh, having a, uh, having a mystery partner in, in this cage match and, and doing all of that, you know, that, that whole angle, you know, and again, at, at this point, I mean, this October of '86. Right. I broke in in June of '84. Yeah, you're two-year veteran now. So yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a whole two plus years now in, into this thing, and 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 I'm, you know, they ask me what I'm thinking. I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm two years into this deal. You know, if you guys got certainly a lot more experience than I do, and and if you think it'll work, then hey, let you know, then let's go for it. And uh, I still contend to this day that that of course there wasn't the advent of the internet or anything. You know, like uh, like you know, interviews uh, such as this, sure. but but that uh, that it was probably one of the best kept secrets in wrestling um, because even recently I was talking with Tully Blanchard and a couple other guys and and, and nobody knew you know JJ and and uh, uh, and Ole Anderson JJ Dill Dillon and Ole Anderson were in the match that night and you know Tully was at ringside and but but nobody knew no nobody Dusty knew Crockett knew but but outside of that really. Not too many people really knew who his mystery partner was going to be that night until that night. And so it was one of the best kept secrets in wrestling and, and, and really catapulted, as you're saying, to a whole nother level. Because, you know, and the way we, we parlayed that that night and 
to turn a fan from who, you know, the show before in the Charlotte, again, this was in the oh, Charlotte yeah. Coliseum as well, to, to, to turn a fan who, you know, the, 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 the show before in the Coliseum that, you know, that was, you know, spitting on me, yelling at, you know, all this stuff, to, to all of a sudden be in the stands and for 15 minutes chant my name and their shirts off and doing the most muscular pose, you know, and sticking their tongues out and all that. For, for me, it was absolutely just just mind-boggling. To, again, because I'm only a couple years into this deal. Yeah. And, and so for me to experience that and to see this change and to look around that arena and, and all, and, and then... And then to take one interview, and Dusty and I go on an interview, and you know we're forming the superpowers, and and do that one interview, and then the magazine cover, you know, with, with uh, you know I, I cry a tear for Magnum TA. I mean, I still have people talk about that magazine cover, you know, and and, and it's interesting because, you know, they 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 all know now it's it's entertainment, but yet at the same time. Uh, going back to the realism, there was still such a touch of realism to it that when they saw that magazine, it it is as silly it to some as this may sound, it gripped a lot of people's hearts. And because I've had them tell me they th- they thought here's this this guy that this Russian guy who 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 had a heart of stone and just you know stone cold long before Austin ever came around came around. That's right. And and, and here he is. But now all of a sudden, there's a side of, of feeling or emotion to him that we've never seen before. He really, he really does have a heart because he, and just that whole again, that whole you know, like the best of seven, that whole story, that whole angle with the cover on the magazine, that you know, with the interview of forming the superpowers, and then what happened that night and showing that to people. It did. It took. It took the business, you know. Everywhere, you know, Dusty and I. Whether it was Dusty and I as the superpowers, or there were times that that we teamed up with the Legion of Doom Road Warriors in eight, eight man tag matches against against uh, the Four Horsemen, and you'd be in the corner sometimes. And right. it, it just took it sell out business everywhere. It just took it to a whole another level. It took my career, yeah, without a doubt, to to a whole another level. It sure did. Yeah, oh, magic, I mean, magic time, and and uh, you know, just something that. You know, it is nice. It's nice to have those memories to look back on, being part of the evolution of the business, so to speak. You know, because it was it was a transition time. It was a time when you know the, the ter- there were still territories. It was before all the you know the the real two superpowers. You know, the the north and the south. Every night we're out there right. trying to compete and and competing uh, for people wise with the WWF, giving better wrestling shows. Uh, and depicting a, a much more hard-fought wrestling competition by comparison of the Hulk Hogan era of you know the the, the showboat walk in and out big interests yeah the, the fifteen minute know, intro yeah. and the five minute match I, I, exactly yeah. and, and and just seeing all that that come together and being part of that time you know it, it, it was a, an honor to have done it uh, and it couldn't you couldn't sit down and write a script and put all that into place certain things just had to happen. To make that available, you absolutely. Know? In fact, you know, you talk you talk about what what comes to mind. I, th- I thought of this a little bit earlier too. Is when you talk about the head to head competition. You know, I, I, again, I go back to Philadelphia, which I- ended up becoming w- one of our our best wrestling towns. That in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I remember when we first came into Philadelphia, and, and they had been so schooled and trained on those type of matches. That when we went in there and and and, and wrestled thirty minutes, I mean, you know, if you wrestled Tully thirty minutes, or I was wrestling, you know, Flair for forty minutes, or I, I mean, you know, I'm wrestling the world, you know, or the world champion, or you're wrestling the world TV champion, or vice versa, or whatever, and, and yet in the stands, people are chatting boring for for forty minutes <laughs> because yeah. because they weren't used to that. But I'll never forget over a period of about six months. As we as we brought that fan around to our brand of wrestling, that it wasn't long it, it, within a six month period of time, and 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 from that point on, that if you or I wrestled Flair for an hour, that no. those people were on their feet for an hour, and and you didn't you didn't hear boring one no. time during during the whole match, and. and you know that that to me just it, it kind of personifies really what we did in the wrestling world and and the quality of what we brought 
to the wrestling fan. And so I, you know, I look back on things and, and, I, and I, you know, my career, you know, and, and you know, there was, there was a, a point in there where, you know, where I, where I walked away from it because, you know, um, someone uh, dear to me was, was dying of cancer. And so I, I, I chose to walk away and, and, and help take care of that person. And so my career wasn't as long as, as some could have been. I mean, you know, 1984 to 1993, essentially, with a couple of years in there where, where, where I, I didn't wrestle. So my career uh, technically wasn't much longer than yours from that, that standpoint. But yet, when I look back on being a part of that business, when people ask me, you know, they ask me now, do you miss it and stuff? You know, I, I, I don't miss it. it. It was a chapter in, in, in my life that was, uh, I feel I counted a blessing to have been a part of it, uh, a privilege to have been a part of it, to have had the opportunity to, to be a part of it, and uh, certainly has, has catapulted me to be able to do many of the things uh, that I'm doing now that, that, uh, that, and that we can talk about and, and some of the stuff you're, you're doing now as well. Um, that I think the, the the listener, the viewer out there would would really want to know. You know, where are they now? So, so kind of a where are they now segment. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe we can. Kinda... Right, right before you talk about that, I do want to talk about the one instance when you returned to wrestling and you basically endorsed the team of Nikita and Dusty and maybe what the feelings were that night. You're talking think... about Baltimore. Baltimore. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, big big deal. You know, for me, uh, is my first first time back in front of the wrestling fan. The Crockett so protected me, you know, in that hospital setting that I was in for five months. Uh, had 24 hour security. Uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize, honestly, we were so caught up in the, in what we did and the passion for what we did and the performances. I personally didn't realize the total impact and how many people were really watching what we were doing until I crashed because all of a sudden the just enormous overwhelming you know wave of people that were trying to reach me trying to contact me well wishers letters flowers cards you know seeing people camped out you know on television camped out outside the hospital and trying to come up fire escapes and all this stuff it kind of hit me at that time you know that what we were doing you know was these people had taken us into their families you know we were part of their families and we were having a huge impact on their lives. You know, this wasn't just entertainment for them. It was something special. And for me, it put a different twist on things because I played this character, this American hero, so to speak, that overcame adversities and the big bad Russian and all these things. And all of a sudden, you know, I've got a real life challenge of epic proportion. And walking out of the hospital five months later was the greatest challenge I'd ever ever taken on in my life and I did and shortly thereafter uh, the Crockett's you know said we'd like you to you know make your first public appearance at you know the Crockett Cup in Baltimore and and you know I'll tell you you know I you know it's, it's actually even hard to really think about it real hard right now because it's one of the most emotional things I've ever been through in my life what I'd been through that five months in the hospital uh, you know being 27 years old and you know, literally having the path that I had chosen at that time totally just blocked and, and made a, you know, a, a true physical impossibility no matter how much I wanted to, you know, continue to think I would overcome. You know, I knew that, you know, that, you know, this era of my life was, was over and to be, in, be there with the people that I had such passion for. I mean, we, the brotherhood that we had you know, going up and down the road and giving of ourselves, our bodies, everything we had in the ring to, to, to depict these, these big conflicts made us a family so tight-knit, more, more so than most of the families today. I mean, we were, you know, just so in tune with each other. So to have the culmination of being out there in front of all these people again, feeling that crowd and all that electricity and, and their and they're just true feelings for me. And then seeing Dusty and Nikita there, it was one of the most emotional, you know, moments of, of my life. I mean, it was it was a shoot. It was real. It was the effort that I had to exhibit and put forth to get from the from the back 
out there to the ring and back again was more than I ever put out in any wrestling event in my entire life. And it just changed the whole world of perspective you know, for me. And it was a time of transition of trying to figure out where I was going to fit back into this world or what was I going to do. But just to feel that love from all those people again and see like two of my best friends in the world, you know, right there, them standing side by side in that, in that, you know, that mm. arena was just, you know, something that uh, transcended the business, transcended the event, transcended that moment of something that was just almost surreal. And, and, and you know, Baltimore for me became my favorite town of wrestling. I mean, there, there were a lot of towns that I enjoyed wrestling in, you know, I, for the for the viewer out there, but but Baltimore became my favorite. Just just the heartbeat of Baltimore, the inner harbor, just just the whole pulse of Baltimore, uh, the the support of the fans, and 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 I agree. and I think what what it did for the fan that night, and and is, you know, it brought it, it brought things to reality in that, you know, even for the person that might had still been thinking up to that point, well. Okay, wrestling's entertainment, and and maybe he's not really hurt, or, or I, I at that point, whether it was that fan in the arena in Baltimore that night, or the viewer who would watch the video of that later on, or or whatever, at that point said, you know what, this is this is a this is a real life story here, um, and. Uh, yeah, so it, well, I think I think for everyone involved that that was an emotional night that night in Baltimore at, at that Crockett Cup, and and uh, again, that's you know you, you talk about and, and what really generated that too was was the camaraderie that all of us had, and and up to that point, we had pretty much pretty much had a working relationship. Exactly. Because um, we were in different dressing rooms. You know, it's not like this era where you're all in one big dressing room. You know, we were in separate dressing rooms, a lot of times on separate ends of the arena. And, yeah, couldn't communicate. And, and and we didn't travel in cars together. We, we you know, we, we might have been on a plane together, and but in many times, especially if it was a commercial flight, you know, we, we you know, you sat in back, I sat in front, vice versa, whatever. And, and so we had a good working relationship with one another, but it was that uh, happening that I feel took, took us from a working relationship that brought it to a, a friendship, if you will, is the way I view it anyway, that, that it took it from a working relationship to a friendship and uh, one that has you know, become at this point you know, a, a lifelong friendship. And uh, so I think, I think that evening was, it was uh, just kind of, it, it, there was there was many aspects to that evening that that's you know set set things on a, on a different keel, definitely. And, definitely. and you mentioned it's a it's a <clears throat> this is a success story in terms of what where are you now and where have you gone? Both of you have gone on to accomplish some amazing things, successful businesses. Uh, you know you can talk about your ministry. I, I don't want I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Why don't you go ahead and pick it up and and tell us what's happened since you've gotten out of wrestling? Well, you know. We were talking earlier about, uh, I think, both of us and, and um, you know, as, uh, as we kind of as we kind of separated our ways from wrestling that that, uh, you know, I, I think I, for one, was was able to take that. And, and you know, to a degree, I'm uh, still involved in sorts of, you know, whether it be showing up, you know, like yourself at, you know, at a, a memorabilia show or autograph signing or making a special appearance you know here and and there at different events even be it a small venue or you know a, a large venue whatever the case may be although it's not the central focus of, of of what i do now but i but i use it as a, as a platform for for what i do and uh boy and and for what i do now it just if i really sit down really contemplate and think about it really takes me aback because you know, here I had this, this in many people's eyes, this, this illustrious wrestling career and, and attained this certain amount of fame, if you will, and, and name, face, likeness transposed around the world because of television, satellite te technology, and, and then retired from that. 
but have catapulted that to do a, n a number of other things, um, you know, authoring books. Um, you know, the first one was a uh, book I wrote was called Breaking the Chains, and, and it's uh, subtitled A Handbook to Christian Living, and, and uh, you know, just what, what it means to, to have a, a genuine walk with the Lord and, and, and how to build upon that relationship. It, it, I've come to learn that it's all about relationships. You know, I was talking a minute ago about working relationships, and that relationship became a friendship, and, and, and it's all about relationships that I've come to realize at this point in, in my life. And, and so in, in, in writing that book, uh, trying to teach people how to have a, a closer, stronger, better relationship um, with Christ, which, which I didn't have uh, throughout wrestling. I, I, it wasn't until I left wrestling that, I, I, as I phrased it, I stepped into the squared circle of a lifetime. I walked into a, a church and and yet, you know, the viewer might think, well, hang on here a minute, you know, he's this famous wrestler and, and, you know, traveled all over the world, did all these different things and had all this success and did all these things. But yeah, yeah I did. I, I did do all that. I, I did all of that. But at the same time, I'm like, is this it? There, surely there's, there's got to be more. Something's missing here. There's a piece missing to this puzzle. And it was when I stepped into that squared circle, which was a church, that I realized the piece of the puzzle that was missing. Some call it religion. I get a kick out of that when people, I'm sure you may hear this too. Yeah. You know, yeah, I heard Nikita's a real religious guy now and I get a kick out of it. Or when they say it to me, I, yeah, I hear you, you know, you're real religious. I go, no, I hate religion. And they'll just, it kind of takes them aback. They'll go, huh? I, yeah, I, I hate religion. I, I can't stand religion. Religion's got us in this quagmire of where we're at. And, and, and I go on to explain to them that it's all about relationship. And, and what happened to me on that day in October, ironically, month of October in 1993, was I was introduced to a man by the name of Jesus Christ and how I could have a relationship with him. And in, in, in making that decision to establish that relationship, that has catapulted me with the aid of wrestling to a whole nother level and platform of, of things that I'm doing. You know, that, that book, Breaking the Chains, uh, led to a second book that, that just recently has come out called Wrestling with Success. And people say, what's it about? You know, it's, I, it's, it's in the business section of the bookstores. And, well, yeah, it's about, it's about business. It's about business, but it's about life. It, it, it's really about life. And, and, you know, I was, many would consider me to have been very successful in life up to this point in time. I'm sure there were, if someone were to examine what I've done and the things I've accomplished, be it investments, be it businesses, be it books, whatever, that I've been successful. But again, I revert back to October 19, 1993 because it was on that day that I went from being successful to becoming fulfilled. And, and, and unless someone's really experienced that, they, they may not even be able to relate to that. What, what's he mean being fulfilled? I mean. Prior to that day, there was something missing. But on that day, when I made that decision, what was missing was gone because I had just a sense of fulfillment on that day. And, and, that's, and, and, and that's one of the things I do now. As I travel, I, I speak in schools, I speak at youth groups, I speak at, in churches, I speak all over the world, 11 different countries to date, sharing how my life has, has transformed from a successful wrestling career to a life of fulfillment, to where I don't even miss wrestling. I had the privilege a couple years ago of standing in the RCA Dome in Indianapolis and, and speaking to almost 44,000 teenagers. Wow. An audience of 44,000 teenagers and, and being able to share my life, my successes, but more importantly, what made me fulfill. And so the book, Wrestling with Success, uh, deals with, with moving from success to significance awesome. and fulfillment. And, and uh, you know, already getting, getting emails and feedback from people that, that uh, my old college quarterback, man, I, I got an email not too long ago, out of the blue, haven't talked to him since, uh, since we played together in, in 1980. Uh, I, he went on to play in the USFL, played with Herschel Walker, went on to play, backed up Phil Simms, played the wow. New York Giants for a few years, and 
Haven't talked to him, but got an email out of the blue and said, hey man, I was in Greensboro, North Carolina on business, traveling through the airport, saw your mug on the cover of a book, bought it, read it on the way home back to, back to Moorhead, Minnesota, where I played football. And, and he said, man, it was an awesome book. He said, he said, appreciate you writing it, you know? And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and just, you know, uh, emails like that. And so for me, be, you know, be, be working on another book right now, working on a biography that's gonna take me back as far as I can remember. And, 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 and as far back as I can remember to, to, to present day, whenever we complete that book project, and not only doing the book version of it, but doing a DVD version of it, a, a, a video DVD version of it where got a guy's been filming me for, for over a year and a half and, and traveling with me, you know, traveled to Minnesota and all the old schools and stomping grounds and interviewing old coaches, old mentors, mm. guys who helped school me, train me in bodybuilding and football and, and all these different things. And, and has traveled with me around to different places I've spoke at, interviewed a bunch of the guys, interviewed you. You're going to be on it, dude. <laughs> and, uh, you know, interviewed a lot of the wrestlers, interviewed other pro athletes that, that have become friends of mine. And, and I'm excited about it because I, I think it's going to really just touch a lot of people's hearts and really speak to a lot of people. And, and uh, so I, I'm just... You know, where, where I'm at at this place in time in my life, you know, I told, we were, uh, I, did, I made a special appearance at a wrestling show. Um, in fact, uh, Dusty was on it, and, and I, was, I was special referee for him and, mm. uh, and, and the rock and roll against the, the, the Midnight Express. And a number of the guys I hadn't seen in years, Dennis Condry and, mm -hmm. and other guys in the dress room, they said, man, you know, you, Man, you look great. You just, you know, you got a glow about you. You've got, you know, this and that. And, and man, I just tell them all the same story. And I, I said, that's because, man, I'm fulfilled, man. I, I've, I've got a relationship that I didn't have when I knew you before. And I'm fulfilled. And, and, and I told him, I said, you know what? If, if I died today, I, 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 I die with no regrets. Yeah, there may be a few things maybe I'd change or something. Or, but then again, you know what? I, I don't know that I would because the experiences I went through right. a, a, as part yourself, of part journey. of the journey that brought me to where I am today. So, man, I, I, I'm thrilled. And I, and I know, uh, you know, it's part of your journey. I mean, you, you've had some, oh, some awesome well, experiences the, since yeah, wrestling. And, I'm still in the midst of the journey uh, because, because I, unlike you, did grow up in the church, grew up in, you know, religion, grew up in this atmosphere, but grew up with no relationship, as you were speaking. And I've known the truth from a very young age, but never had it in application. So, you know, having a near-death experience, that's kind of a wake-up call. And, and, mm. and you, get a, uh, you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with God. But what we all have a tendency to do, we all especially people with strong work ethics. We can be the most stubborn people in the world because we have this innate ability to dig down in ourselves and find all these things that we can be strong with and what we can do and we can do and we can do. And that doesn't ever really amount to anything but vanity before it's all said and done and over with. Right. Because if it's only for your glory, that's where it'll end up. And, uh, you know, after the wrestling portion of my life, uh, you know, came to a close, I uh, worked with Turner Broadcasting, we brought you back in, and I was working with Dusty in that area. And when I, when I stepped away from that, spent years just kind of trying to find a niche, trying to find a place, trying to find this thing to do to, to you know, kind of sink my teeth into. And again, I was so stubborn, and I've never said this on tape or in front of anyone or anything else, so this will be a matter of public record. But I was so stubborn all those months in the hospital that I couldn't relinquish the burden that I had to God back then. Mm. All I could pray for was strength. Mm. And God gave me strength. He gave me strength, but he didn't deliver me from the burden because I didn't ask him. Mm. I prayed for strength, mm. prayed for it, and he gave it to me. He lifted me up. He allowed me to be go through the task I had in front of me, walk out of the hospital on my own power, with no you know, artificial devices and gave me strength, but strength that wasn't being renewed and, and, and filled and didn't get 
to the relationship area that I need to be. Let me make a lot more mistakes. Open up a tremendous door for me in a construction industry that at the time and my my ability to to get back to where I was ambulatory again and be able to take care of myself a little bit became a bit of a stumbling block for me in that I would justify a lot of thought processes or a lot of things that I would allow myself to to do and and rationalize because you know you know I've been through a lot right you know I've been through a lot I've had hard times I've, I've been through things and I'm a good guy, and, and I don't want anything bad to happen to anyone, but I would allow myself to get in thought processes that, that would ultimately take me down bad paths that I'd already you know, crossed at other times in my life and repeat a lot of old mistakes. Well, I've, I've heard other pastors talk about things like this happening, like what happened to me with this remarkable thing. One day, this opportunity comes up for me to get involved in the cellular communication construction industry. Out of the blue, on a whim, people were put into my life that had doors to open. And, you know, my dad and his dad were in steel construction for, for, for 20 some years, 30 years, and I was around it, but never had any desire, love, passion for it or anything. And all, all of a sudden, all, almost seemingly through osmosis, I had the ability to run a crane truck with one hand, mm. do all these things wow. that, that you know, was a gift from God. It was a door being opened that I didn't really appreciate what it was because it was very hard, demanding work. It would be hard for you. It would be hard right. for anybody that was able-bodied, much less what I was putting myself through. Right. But God sustained me, brought me through that from a mere $20,000 investment within five-year period of time, built a multi-million dollar business. Wow. And... It was success. There was monies. There was things. There was, uh, you know, I, you know, things of accomplishment. But again, you know, once you had performed in the ring and had that adrenaline rush, had that 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 satisfaction of of being able to perform in front of people and get all those accolades, nothing that you can do in this world, you know, short of people, I guess, that are hooked on drugs or something, gives you that euphoric feeling. Mm -hmm. short of relationship with Christ, relationship with God. And it, because it can't, it can't be duplicated. You know, we, we did something very amazing right. that was very materialistic and it was very uh, self-indulging. We had great work ethics and, and worked hard, but we got something back for our hard work. You know, we, we, we right. realized the fruits of our labor. My business that, 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 that God opened the door and helped me build uh, I sold in 2000 for a astronomical amount of money for me at that time. You know, I never made the millions that people went on to make in the business. So for me, it was a big, it was a big deal. But I, at the same time, went through a divorce that was a very painful situation. Separated me from a young son that uh, you know I loved dearly, and and caused a lot of just real heartache that I brought upon myself by choices. Things that right. I things that I did, worked two years for the company that bought me out, and they failed miserably. They had a this vision that they sold us all on. They bought ten companies across the United States. We're going to combine them all together and make it a national company. Stock options, things and that that were going to be just you know through the moon if they all panned out. But anyway, and none came to be. But I found myself in 2002 with a company that was about to go under, who didn't have any money to give me, but gave me some tools, gave me some things, said, well, you know, we're pulling out of the Carolinas, the whole Southeast, you wanna go back in business for yourself, fine. I've gone mm -hmm. through a, a, a really horrendous divorce, uh, lost a lot of money uh, throughout that, and started a business for the second time. Brought another uh, good man in with me to help me run the business, and what I thought had been tough times of starting up in 1995 <laughs> were nothing compared to what transpired in 2002. That was Magnum Towers, right? I mean, is yes. that what you call it, yeah, Magnum it, Towers? It was Magnum Towers in, in 1995. The new iteration is called Magnum Cellular Service. Mm, okay. And the meager $20,000 investment it took to start the first business that grew and flourished and turned into this million dollar company it took three, four hundred thousand dollars of startup capital the first time. Mm. This is the second time, and it has been just a struggle and a struggle and a struggle to the point where 
we are now starting to see some things evolve and some things that can be opened up. But what it has been is a very humbling experience for me to realize that it's God's business. Mm -hmm. All that I do is His, and that He is just making me a steward of it. I've been a steward of talents. I've been a steward of wealth. I have used some of them wisely. I've used a lot of them very poorly. But now I have a, yet another opportunity. And at 45 years old, I'm making some new choices about open being open to possibilities for the future, what yeah. I do with my time to, today, and the legacy that I want to leave here is not of what Magnum TA did, you know, as a wrestler in that genre. There are pleasant memories, as you and I, you know, love to reminisce. But the the point of the matter is to make a mark on the world. It, it, you have to make a mark on people's souls, on their mm. you know, down to their humanity, to where they can see something in you. That not to aspire to be this big, tough, rugged person that's been successful and made a lot of money. Someone that has been there, who's been through humbling experience, who can admit the adversities that they've been through and the poor decisions that they've made, but can then turn that through the love of Christ in us. And what they see in you. Yeah, into, yeah. that is the success story. The work done on the, on the cross is this success story. And this was all just little chapters in the book leading up to today. It's part of that journey. Yeah. You know, I wish I brought it in. In my car, I just uh, got a letter uh, from a man that had heard me speak. He said, I heard you speak. And um, and this, I, I, I tell you, and, and I say this in, in all humility, but it just, it blesses me to hear this because I, I, I'm getting more and more of these kind of stories. And what you're, exactly what you're talking about. He heard me speak at a church in Charleston, South Carolina called Miles Road Baptist Church in uh, August of 1997. August of 1997. Just got this. So that's, what, eight years ago? Eight years, yeah. And he said, I heard you speak. He said, I was an avid wrestling fan, get drunk every Saturday night, watch wrestling. He said, when I heard you speak, you, you inspired me. And uh, you inspired me to stop drinking. And he said, I, you know, I, uh, I was in and out of uh, uh, a couple of detox centers and I'd quit like three times and, and, and whatnot. And he said, uh, but I never forgot what you said. And in following up and seeing where you are at now, uh, uh, as I've kind of kept abreast of what you're doing, he said, I want you to know that I've now been sober and haven't had a drink in seven years and eight months because how you inspired me that night at, at Miles Road Baptist Church. And, and that really kind of personifies what you're talking about, about what, what others see in us. Because, you know, others, you know, oh yeah, Magnum TA, oh yeah, you know, I, oh, Nikita Koloff, The Russian Nightmare. And, and, and initially, especially wrestling fans, of course, you know, they, they revert back to the wrestling days and what we did in wrestling. But I, I know for myself, when, when I'm out traveling and speaking and, and going around in places, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a school or, you know, whether it's businesses, I'm, doors are opening to, to do uh, motivational speaking, kind of a Zig Ziglar type of deal, you, um, right. where companies are, are, are bringing me in now to... To, to, to motivate their employees or what whatnot and, and and you know that's all well and good but um, you know they don't know it but my goal is not just really to come in and motivate although I want I want to motivate them I want to do that if I'm in a school I, I, want, I want to motivate them in the school but but more than that I, I want to give them some some nuggets something that they can sink their teeth into that they can walk away and 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 say you know, I can do that. I can apply that. See, I, I don't know specifically what I said that night in 1997, but apparently whatever I said inspired that man that he's now seven years and eight months hasn't had a drop of alcohol. And, and so, you know, if, if I can, if I can accomplish that, and, and I essentially hear you saying the same thing, if, you know, if, if, if you and I can accomplish that now that we can take what we did with wrestling and, and that's all well and good, but now use that as a, as a platform in a sense that when people say, well, what are you doing now? 
to say, man, let me tell you. Let me tell you how I've gone from success in wrestling to fulfillment in life. And, uh, boy, if we can do that, man, then uh, that, that'll make, a, like you said, that'll make a greater mark in history than anything we ever did in the wrestling ring. Yes. Gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for uh, sharing not only your battles in the square circle with us, which is how we as fans came to know you, but also giving us little pieces of your life after wrestling. It's been, it's been our pleasure, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it's just been a privilege for me, and, and uh, I'm sure for, for my compadre here, my good friend uh, Magnum. Yeah. T.A., Terry Allen, uh, it's been awesome. And I, I, hope, uh, I hope what we've shared will, will bless somebody out there in the, in the viewing audience. Amen to that.